This is the second in a planned four-part lecture series on the Battle of Okinawa. In the first lecture, I described the strategic planning by the Joint Chiefs of Staff as they wrestled with the strategic question of which landmass to take to choke off the Japanese sea lanes of communication to the rich resource area in the Dutch East Indies. I also described the Japanese defensive plan of the island and the American plan of attack and the command structure of each side. In this lecture, I will describe how the American 10th Army carried out the American plan and how the Japanese defended the island. In the fourth and final lecture, I will describe the use and rationale of the various suicide tactics employed by the Japanese, including the much-feared kamikaze ta attacks on Task Force 58 and the last mission of the giant Japanese battleship Yamato. Operation Iceberg, the code name for the operation, called for the initial landings to take place across the beaches north and south of Hagushi on the west side of Okinawa. Colonel Yahara, the Japanese 32nd Army planning officer, correctly guessed that this would be the landing site. He elected to concede the landings to the Americans, including the two most important airfields on Okinawa, and instead set up a defense in depth farther south, hoping to draw the Americans into a battle of attrition to bleed them white. The 10th Army was composed of two corps, the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps, and the Army 24th Corps. The 3rd Amphibious Corps was composed of the 1st and 6th Marine Divisions. They landed on the left and were initially to capture Yantan Airfield. The 24th Corps was composed of the Army 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions. They were to land on the right of the 3rd Amphibious Corps and secure Kadena Airfield. The Corps dividing line was the Bishi River. The 3rd Amphibious Corps landed to the left and the Army 24th Corps to the right of this river. Here in the shaded circles are the four assault divisions. Here are the divisional boundaries. The 6th Marine Division on the far left with the 1st Marine Division on its right. The 7th Infantry Division to the right of the 1st Marine Division and the 96th Infantry Division on the far right. Each division consisted of two assault regiments, each of which consisted of two assault battalions for a total of 16 assault battalions. Each regiment would keep one battalion in reserve. Each division would retain one regiment in division reserve and one in corps reserve, the typical two-unit forward, one-unit back tactic common with a triangular unit configuration during the war. The reserve units would be called on an as-needed basis and inserted into the lines where most needed. The priority would be battalion reserve, division reserve, and corps reserve. As a preliminary operation to Iceberg, to secure an anchorage for Admiral Turner's ships of Task Force 58 for refueling, rearmament, and repair, the 77th Infantry Division, known as the Statue of Liberty Division, landed on four of the Karama Islands on March 26 at 0800. There was virtually no opposition to the landings as neither General Yushijima nor Colonel Yahara expected an American coup de main in the Karamas. The Japanese had garrisoned the island with only 975 soldiers of whom 700 were Korean laborers of mediocre fighting worth. Here are troops of the 77th Division coming ashore in the Karamas, supported by Amtraks. On March 27th, at 0911, two battalions of the 306th Regiment landed on the largest island, Takashiki. Resistance was light, and within three days, the two battalions had completely overrun the island. The 77th Division suffered 31 KIA and 81 wounded and killed 530 Japanese in taking the islands. Admiral Turner now had an anchorage that would pay big dividends throughout the campaign. There was, however, an additional benefit from taking the islands. Many of the Japanese in the Karamas were there to operate facilities for the sea raiding squadrons, suicide boats that were there to attack the transports. More than 350 suicide boats were captured and destroyed by the 77th Division in the Karamas. 
from hideouts in the islands, these boats were to speed to the American transports. The objective of the attack, General Yushijima ordered, will be transports loaded with essential supplies, material, and personnel. The attack will be carried out by concentrating maximum strength immediately upon the enemy's landing. These boats were made of plywood and were 18 feet long with a 5-foot beam. They were powered by, of all things, a Chevrolet engine of about 85 horsepower and could attain speeds upwards of 30 knots. They carried a 300-kilogram explosive. A final preliminary operation consisted of the occupation of the Kiisi Islands on L-1, where two battalions of 155mm howitzers were emplaced to support the landings the next day. Each battalion was composed of three batteries of four howitzers each for a total of 24 guns. At 0406, still in darkness, Admiral Turner radioed the now traditional order, land the landing force. Forty-five minutes later, the ships of the bombardment force began shelling the landing beaches. Ten battleships fired their main guns along eight miles of the beaches. Four of the battleships were Pearl Harbor survivors, and two, the Texas and New York, had sailed halfway around the world after the Normandy invasion to join the Pacific Fleet. Along with the battleships were cruisers and destroyers. Together they fired over 7,000 tons of shells at Okinawa's beaches, ranging in caliber from 40 millimeter to 16 inch. Although impressive to watch, most of the effort was wasted, directed at hills and draws inland from the beaches that held no enemy. As dawn broke on the morning of El Day, the weather was favorable. The sun was bright and the skies clear. The wind from the east was light and the surf on the reef and beach was negligible. At 0830, H hour, the amphibious tanks rumbled from the shallow water of the reef onto the beach. Marines and GIs jumped out and rushed ashore to a seawall that, by now, had been blasted by the shore bombardment. Forming in skirmish lines, the assault companies moved out heading across the fields toward their initial objectives. Except for an occasional mortar shell and sniper fire, they met no resistance. Simultaneous with the main landings at Hagushi, the 2nd Marine Division staged a successful demonstration off the beach at Minnetoga, then retreated. This led the Japanese to believe that they had repelled the invasion, which they reported to Tokyo. Though General Yushijima and Colonel Yahara had planned no more than a delaying action, resistance behind the beaches may have been less than either had expected. To defend the airfields and to fight a prolonged war of resistance, so the order read, Yushijima had assigned the defense of the airfields to a regiment composed of airfield construction and service troops, an Okinawan home guard, or boitai, many of whom were high school students. In total, there were nearly 3,500 of these ragtag troops. There was just one company of 120 regular army troops. Although armed with only light weapons, they could have seriously delayed both the Marines and the GIs, but they fled when the pre-invasion bombardment began. By 1000, about an hour and a half after H hour, the 6th Marine Division had occupied their initial objective, Yantan Airfield. At about the same time, the 17th Regiment of the 7th Infantry Division had reached Kadena Airfield. Neither was defended, and all installations were occupied intact. The two airfields, which nobody had expected would fall before L plus 3, had been taken virtually without a shot being fired. Throughout the afternoon of April 1st, resistance remained light. At the northern extremity of the beaches, the 22nd and 4th Marines of the 6th Marine Division kept right on going after crossing the Anton Airfield and moved into the rugged ground to the north and east. South of the Anton Airfield, soldiers of the 96th and 7th Divisions of the Army had also overrun their initial objective, Kadena Airfield, 
and moved further east and south. They had passed numerous field fortifications, but few were occupied. This was the extent of the penetration at the end of L Day. The Marines and soldiers dug in for the night. The lines were tied in together to close gaps in the flanks. By nightfall of L Day, the 10th Army had established a beachhead more than two miles deep and eight miles wide, and one that contained an asset beyond price two relatively undamaged airfields. The first night passed quietly. There were no bonsai charges that night. During that first day and throughout the battle, the Marines and soldiers encountered Okinawan civilians, the first within a few minutes of landing. The Okinawan civilians would be the ones who were the real losers in the Battle of Okinawa. They had been warned by the Japanese that the Americans would rape and torture them. Many committed suicide as the Americans advanced. Many were killed inadvertently, and some were killed as human shields for the Japanese. Some were convinced to surrender and then given food and medical treatment. I recommend reading this short book about this little Okinawan girl with the white flag by Tomiko Higa. The biggest threat of the day was not from the 32nd Army, but from kamikaze attacks. One hit an LST off the demonstration beach at Minnetoga, killing 24 and wounding 21 sailors. The ship otherwise survived and limped into the Karama Anchorage for repairs. The most spectacular kamikaze attack occurred early in the evening at 1913, when a steep diving plane plunged into the USS West Virginia. Casualties were light, with only four killed and 23 wounded. Damage to the ship was slight, and she remained on station. Over the course of the next two days, the troops pushed south toward Chanton and almost reached the Ishikawa Isthmus, taking ground the planners had not expected would fall for 10 to 15 days. This was the extent of the advance after L plus 2, April 2nd. The 6th Marine Division advanced against little resistance along the left flank of the 1st Division. The 1st Division lunged across the island toward the east coast against virtually no resistance. The 96th Division pivoted south until they had reached the L plus 10 phase line of the planners. They were well ahead of schedule. They tied in with the 7th Division, also advancing against little resistance the two army divisions were poised to begin the advance south. The most pressing need at the end of April 3rd was an answer to the question, where are the Japanese? At the end of April 3rd, Colonel Yahara's chief concern was not the 10th Army's rapid advance, but the possibility that General Buckner might race an armored task force down the east coast and outflank the Shuri line. General Buckner had no intention of making so bold a move. In contrast to Yahara, General Cho chafed restlessly during the first three days of the campaign. He had never approved of Yahara's defensive plan. Cho pressed Yushijima to launch a counterattack into the American lines. If Japanese attackers could infiltrate the American line to a very close range, they could negate the American superior firepower. The entire front, in his estimation, would crumble into disorder and man-to-man -man combat. Yahara thought Cho's plan utter nonsense. If the Japanese exposed themselves from their hidden caves, they would be vulnerable to American air attacks and naval bombardment. During the ensuing heated discussions, General Yushijima listened passively. At the end of the meeting, he quietly rose and approved of Cho's plan. But Yushijima was by no means completely sold on Cho's plan. He greatly respected Yahara's ability and knew that his chief planning officer understood the tactics of modern warfare better than any of his other officers. Accordingly, the next night, April 4th, when a strong concentration of American ships was reported off the coast, he abruptly canceled the counterattack. On the American side of the front, Major General John Hodge, commanding the 24th Corps, 
had already stopped worrying about a Japanese counterattack. He was more concerned with sustaining the momentum of the advance. Even though the 96th and 7th Divisions were thinly spread along the front, if the Japanese advanced, his battalions could recoil into protective perimeters and summon a ferocious concentration of shellfire, the likes of which General Cho had neither experienced nor could imagine. The nickname of the 96th Division was the Dead Eye Division. The nickname of the 7th Division was the Hourglass Division. These are their shoulder patches. On the afternoon of April 3rd, General Hodge gave the order to the 96th Division to seize the Urasoa Mura escarpment that dominated the western side of the line. This escarpment would later become known as Hacksaw Ridge. He assigned the equally dominating mass of Hill 178 and the coastal area in the vicinity of Oyuki on the eastern side of the island to the 7th Division. This was the 24th Corps' initial objective. This was the front line as of April 3rd and from where the advance south began in earnest. The four regiments of the two divisions jumped off at 0800 the next day, April 4th. This was the extent of the advance on April 5th and on April 8th. There were three paved highways running more or less north and south that were integral to the southward advance, routes 1, 5, and 13. The Urasoa Mura escarpment lay between highways 1 and 5, putting it within range of Japanese guns dug into the hillsides. The 96th Division would have to take the escarpment so that routes 1 and 5 could be used for the advance. Hill 178 dominated the surrounding hills, Skyline Ridge extended east from Hill 178 almost to Route 13 on the East Coast Flat. For Highway 13 to be of any use, troops of the 7th Division would have to take both Hill 178 and its appendage, Skyline Ridge. General Hodge needed all three roads to supply the continued advance south. The odds favored the Americans with two full divisions of well-equipped, experienced troops. But the Japanese had certain advantages to counter American numerical superiority. All units were dug into the hills, skillfully camouflaged, and completely integrated from shore to shore across the island. The 47mm anti-tank guns, for example, were hidden so carefully as to be undetectable at two paces. This is the Japanese 47mm anti-tank gun that was so effective against the American Sherman medium tank. At first, the assault companies of both divisions advanced rapidly, but sharp fights from several Japanese outposts soon ran up the casualties. The honeymoon of the first three days of the campaign was over. On April 4th, in the 96th Division sector, three Sherman medium tanks were hit by 47mm anti-tank rounds and set afire. A 47mm round could penetrate a 35-ton Sherman's armor at several hundred yards range. No tank in the American armored inventory at this stage of the war could approach a Japanese position with impunity. Two tough battles were fought on April 4th and 5th. In the 96th Division zone, a coral ridge known as Cactus Ridge, a long narrow hill, flanked Route 1. Japanese occupation of this ridge prevented the 96th from moving further south. It had to be taken. The second involved a coral outcrop that had stopped elements of the 7th Division. This became known as the Pinnacle. The Pinnacle barred the safe movement along Route 13 and the east side coastal plain below. The defense of Cactus Ridge to the west and the Pinnacle to the east marked the start of resistance by the Japanese land forces on Okinawa. Early the next morning on April 6th, following a 10-minute artillery barrage, B Company stepped off toward the Pinnacle. Three times B Company attacked and failed being pushed back the last time after reaching the base of the pinnacle. Its men could not endure the shower of grenades and knee mortar shells raining down on them from above. The company commander was wounded from a TNT charge tossed down from the top. 
with the failure of B Company's third attack, C Company went in around the Japanese flank up a rugged but covered route from the west. Preoccupied with B Company to their front, the Japanese failed to see C Company coming in from their left flank. The men of C Company reached the summit and found the Japanese literally under their feet in holes and caves. The GIs blasted the Japanese in their caves with flamethrowers and BARs. Only about 20 Japanese escaped to the south. B Company suffered one KIA and 10 wounded. C Company had no losses. Here is a photo of the pinnacle and its western approaches over which C Company moved to capture it. The pinnacle had been as foreboding and dangerous as any position on Okinawa, but it fell relatively easily because it stood alone, unsupported, and was vulnerable from one of its flanks. Its fall enabled the 7th Division to continue their advance on high ground along the east coast. Here is a contemporary photo of the pinnacle. The inset provides a nice comparison with the pinnacle from the war. Here is another contemporary view of the pinnacle. The GIs had to fight uphill, a distinct disadvantage to the attacker, as the tactical advantage goes to the defender with the height advantage. This is a view that the Japanese would have had looking out from inside their bunker. Unlike the isolated pinnacle, Cactus Ridge in the 96th Division's West Coast sector could not be outflanked. There was no easy way to assault it except from the front. Mines, an anti-tank ditch, and barbed wire protected its full 1,500-foot length. On April 5th, two tanks were knocked out by 47mm anti-tank shots and had to be abandoned. Heavy Japanese machine gun and mortar fire halted the assault. American forces were forced to withdraw. On the following day, April 6th, the Japanese positions continued to hold up the 383rd. American forces continued to make direct frontal assaults against the ridge through heavy Japanese mortar fire. Such assaults ultimately resulted in charging and reducing Japanese position with grenades and small arms fire. By the end of the day, these American bonsai-type charges by the 2nd Battalion enabled the 383rd to ultimately gain the western half of Cactus Ridge. On April 7th, similar tactics by the 3rd Battalion allowed the 383rd to capture the rest of Cactus Ridge, but it had come at a high cost. The battalions knocked out 15 pillboxes, many mortar positions, and against 30 killed or wounded, had killed an estimated 150 Japanese. Cactus Ridge and the Pinnacle were but the strongest of the Japanese outposts. Many lesser ones in the center of the island had also required elaborate maneuver and at considerable cost to eliminate. Anti-tank gunners of the 383rd Infantry 96th Division fire at Japanese positions in the Mashiki area, the approaches to Cactus Ridge. I will continue this lecture in Part 3 of Okinawa, The Last Battle.